Are we on the brink of an AI revolution in the workplace? Or are we already in the midst of it? This is your host, Neil C. Hughes, and you're listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where every day we explore the intersections of technology and the everyday world. And today we're going to be diving deep into the realm of artificial intelligence in the workplace. And I've got a very special guest, Hugo Sarazin, Chief Product and Technology Officer at a company called UKG. Now, UKG is a name synonymous with redefining workforce management. And they emerged from the groundbreaking merger of Ultima Software and Kronos. And today they stand as a beacon guiding over 75,000 organisations around the world through intricacies of employee needs and so much more. But our conversation today is going to revolve around the ethical implementation of AI, the transformative impact of AI in the workplace and how UKG is upskilling its workforce to embrace this tech wave. From hackathons that spark innovation to the critical role of transparency and AI adoption, we're going to explore the divergent views of executives and employees on AI's presence in their daily tools and operations, and maybe even uncover how UKG is not just focusing on white-collar tech advancements, but more importantly, how they're revolutionising the frontline worker experience, a sector that has remained largely stagnant in technological growth. Now, before we get today's guest on the podcast, I want to talk very quickly about how legacy managed file transfer tools, or MFTs, are dangerously looking dated, and they lack the security that today's remote workforce demands. But companies that continue relying on this outdated technology are running the risk of putting their sensitive data at risk. So I have partnered with the lovely people at KiteWorks, and they're sponsoring Tech Talks daily. And if you're hearing about them for the first time, KiteWorks MFT Suite provides unmatched software security hardening and has an ongoing bounty program and regular penetration testing to minimise vulnerabilities along with one-click appliance updates. Now, the level of security on KiteWorks MFT is often not found in other solutions, which may require multiple unhardened servers. So, before I get today's guest on, please step into the future of secure managed file transfer with KiteWorks. And you can do that by simply visiting kiteworks.com to get started. That's kiteworks.com to get started today. But now, let's get today's guest on. Buckle up and hold on tight, because I'm going to beam your ears all the way to Florida where you can join me and Hugo in conversation. So, a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell everyone listening a little about who you are and what you do? I'm the Chief Product and Technology Officer at the UKG, which is a you know a HCM uh, provider, a vendor uh, based out of uh, Florida, South Florida. And for people hearing about UKG for the very first time, how would you describe it to anyone listening anywhere in the world? So it's it's um, during the pandemic. We picked our time very carefully. Uh, we combined two uh, uh, companies that were operating in the space. One was Kronos, which is the leader in the workforce management uh, space, uh, helping with uh, time and attendance, scheduling, and forecasting. With uh, Ultimate Software, which uh, is a leader uh, here uh, in the U.S. Uh, around payroll, HR, core system talent management, talent acquisition. So now we have a, a company that combines the two, um, and you know we've you know taken the best uh, and, and and the greatest from each of uh, the solutions, and we're we're you know going to market with the one integrated suite. Uh, for uh, the, the mid-market and the large enterprise, and then another one targeted at the SMB side. Fantastic. And, of course, fast forward a few years, we're now in a post-pandemic world, and uh, I'm curious, how have things changed for you? And, uh, and maybe elaborate on UKG strategy for upskilling your workforce or uh, your client's workforce, particularly in the context of integrating AI tools and technologies into your engineering organizations there's so much going on there isn't there? it's it, it's crazy if you look back on just how far we've come from the pandemic to to where we are now and, and how, how ai is dominating every conversation it, it is a very very exciting time and um it is not a new topic i both chronos uh and ultimate had uh, adopted a lot of ai uh dating as far back as 2015 
Uh, there's been you know models that have been used, uh, and, and you know I'm you know, proud to say that today, based on all this work and the multiple iterations, and, and I can give you a bit of a sense of the things we put in into the solution. I mean, we have 2,500 AI model, but to your specific question, what happened in you know uh, since the pandemic is just an acceleration. Uh, both in terms of how our clients are seeing the impact of AI and are, are viewing the opportunity to use this technology to facilitate work and make the, the, the lives of employees better. Um, and also just the way, uh, you know, our, uh, you know, organization is building products. So it's, it's really pretty transformative. And now with the arrival of Gen AI, um, we're seeing just another wave of innovation that we're trying to, to introduce. So. A lot of really, really exciting stuff. When I was doing a little research on you before you came on the podcast, I was reading about how UKG has been hosting AI-focused global hackathons. So how have these events contributed to things like innovation and creativity within the company? And Are you able to share any successful outcomes or, or even breakthroughs from these hackathons? Yeah, so we, we've done hackathons for, for many, many, many years. Uh, but uh, after the pandemic, uh, we, we uh, refocused them and, and retargeted them and uh, in a few ways. The first one, uh, we made them uh, operate in, in, as a two-step. Uh, the first step is we have a Spark Tank, uh, which is a series of knowledge sharing, learning events, sometimes with vendors, sometimes with partners, sometimes with with uh, other participants where we're using it to set the context and get people to understand, you know, problem that could benefit from a hackathon. Um, the second thing we've done is we've targeted them a bit more uh, clearly against uh, specific business processes or problem that our customers are experiencing or technology you want to use. And in the, in the last 18 months, you know, more or less all of them have had an AI flavor to them. And uh, it's been fabulous uh, in two ways. The first one, we got a lot of really, really, really good ideas. Uh, and we got uh, things that are now going into uh, production, into the, the roadmap, and I can give you, share some example, that are direct outcomes uh, of some of these hackathons. So ideas that are coming from the ground, uh, from people who are experiencing it and seeing it. And, and, but the bigger uh, benefit, I think, is uh, we just got everybody to realize the impact. And through the Spark Tank uh, process up front, we are using it to train people and get people to see the opportunity. And we've got OpenAI involved, we got Google involved, and we got other vendors to come and, and, and you know get us to play with the tools in different ways. And not just in engineering, not just in, in product, but you know, across the organization. So we have people in marketing, people in uh, sales, people in pre-sales, uh, support, uh, and we've made this like a company-wide uh, opportunity. So to go back to the specific example, um, yeah. we've had in the 48 hours, people are creating uh, API interfaces, uh, which is um, making the integration of the solution uh, more easy. We've had uh, you know uh, predictors of uh, behaviors uh, being created that we're using now to inform in context uh, actions that we want to let employees do. We've had uh, a reporting. Uh, you can imagine that the reporting is very hard. Uh, data uh, is you know, scattered in various places. Now you can have conversational interfaces uh, with uh, reports um, so that it, uh, you don't need to learn uh, you know, very detailed language. And you can create dashboards or other things like that. All of these things are, you know, both in proof of concept. You know, so we have versions of that now that have been scaled up and are trying to be built to uh, enterprise grade uh, to be rolled out uh, or later this year. So a really huge, 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 huge impact on on so many things. Um, we're very, very excited about that. And another reason I was excited to get you on the podcast today was having read your recent AI survey, which highlighted a significant disconnect between C-suite leaders and employees, especially regarding AI usage in the workplace. What, can you expand on that? And also maybe what's, what you think is driving this perception gap? 
Yeah. So what we ended up doing as part of you know normal course of business, we always do research uh, to understand you know user needs, user demand, perception, uh, and the explosion of Gen AI uh, last year has brought you know this AI thing right uh, at the middle of the consciousness of everybody, and it's so easy and so surprising for for many folks who haven't paid attention deeply to AI. Uh, so we wanted to know, as we are bringing forward more innovation in our products, as we are trying to help uh, HR professionals and employee more broadly you know, use this, where where are they? Um, so the, the survey we did, we, we, we went around uh, thousands and thousands of people around the world. And what we found is there's a disconnect. Uh, there's a disconnect between what management uh, thinks is being done and the value that AI can bring and uh, what uh, employees uh, are think is being done with AI and the value. And the disconnect is a- across a few uh, areas. The first one, it's not super surprising, but it's still interesting. Um, there is uh, a lot of, uh, of employees, a lot of workers, don't realize that many tools that they're currently using as an element of AI. And I'll give you two very simplistic example, um, the Siri and Alexa, you know, when you talk to them, there is a, uh, AI engine behind that, that allows it to respond to your queries. Yeah. Another one is when you use Google translate in your day to day work, there's a, 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 you know, a language model behind that, that does some translation. People may not realize that that's AI, but that's that that's AI, uh, and that gets you know you know bundled in with uh, Gen AI. It gets bundled in with you know the Terminator and the end of the world. So there's all these things uh, that get confused. But the reality is there's a whole spectrum, and it's useful to kind of you know think very carefully about the various components, and um, you know that's the opportunity. Think for 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 leaders and, and managers is to you know not you know go into these extreme and the definition of what it can and will not do uh, can do and will not uh, be able to do but you know try to highlight that there are things that it can do there are things that are today safe that are ethical uh, that you can guard against biases and there are other things where you need to be a bit more thoughtful uh, and 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 maybe more move more slowly. Uh, but not combine all of this into one bucket. And if we uh, are careful, then we can realize that there's a lot of really fun things uh, that are going to make the lives of different employees and uh, different roles, different tasks, um, much easier moving forward. Um, and um, so that's that's kind of what came out of the survey. And, uh, and there's lots of details and people should you know download it from... Uh, uh, the internet, but it's it's a pretty pretty informative to see the disconnect, and it's not surprising. We're at the beginning of uh, a technology adoption uh, cycle, so people are trying to figure out what it is that this is, and uh, we'll see over time people get a lot more sophisticated. So, given that the majority of employees would also embrace AI much much more if companies were a little bit more transparent about its usage. How are you at UKG addressing this need for greater transparency and, and ultimately build that trust around AI that, that seems to be lacking in some circles at the moment? Yeah, it's a really great question. And and, and you're, you're hitting, the, the main thing is uh, it's uh, not unlike anything else that management needs to do. Uh, you know, it starts with trust. And, you know, we, we um, some of uh, your listener may or may not know that we, we acquired great place to work um, many, many years ago, uh, which uh, has millions and millions of data points across uh, many uh, companies to understand what are the behaviors, what are the techniques, what are the the the, 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 the ways companies can be uh, gr- become great company. And, and one of the most important thing is how you build trust. So it's central, uh, and AI is is a, a clearly an, a, an opportunity for uh, companies to do so. And it starts with uh, transparency of its usage. Uh, it also starts with uh, an opportunity to create uh, a human in the loop. Uh, I think it, it, 
there are, there are solutions that are being built today that um, you know don't make that easy uh, when uh, sensitive outcomes are there. And I think uh, if you can give uh, some degree of control um, and augment uh, the human rather than uh, do it to the human, I think you kind of you know close that uh, trust gap. Uh, and then be very clear on some of the principles that you you're using to uh, you know do AI ethically, uh, how you're testing your product, how you're debiasing the data, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, that translates uh, to your specific question. And when UKG builds products, uh, we're we're aiming to uh, make them uh, with human in the loop at every single step of the way so that uh, you can always uh you know improve the training and understand you know what are the drivers of some of the outcomes that are coming out we're also uh making it clearer uh what data sets is being used and what data is available and in some cases uh make it uh opt in opt out that sort of stuff um, and then we're coaching our clients on how to do this. I mean, there's a whole change management that is required to deploy some of these tools and make it, uh, you know, uh, uh, exciting and reach its full potential. Incredibly cool. And of course, over the last, what, five, 10 years, we've seen what damages we can do by moving fast and breaking things with technology. So, there is a, a much stronger focus now on ethical considerations, especially around AI adoption. So how are you at UKG ensuring those ethical considerations are, are not overlooked in the race to adopt AI, especially when some companies might be guilty of prioritizing speed over ethics? And we won't mention any names, but I suspect we've both seen a few. But oh, yeah. how are you approaching this? <laughs> yeah, so we, we've done a few things. Uh, the first one is, um, you know, we, we made that a principle. So, you know, uh, across uh, all of UKG, we, we adopted a, an ethical AI uh, set of principle. Uh, we've trained all our product and our engineers to uh, appreciate, understand, and, un and, 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 and view that as an integral part of the design and the testing products. So that's kind of one thing. Like, uh, you need to write it down, and writing it down, you know, uh, led to some interesting debates. Uh, and then second is you need to uh, put in place the appropriate governance, uh, give a voice to different stakeholders that may see things differently. So it's not purely, they said UKG, it's not purely an engineering thing. There are other stakeholders across the company that can bring different points of view. Uh, and uh, the third thing is, you know, we, we need to role model some of these tough discussions. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a fun example. Um, just to make this real, you can't imagine uh, that you could in a uh, enterprise software um, where you are trying to encourage uh, collaboration, communication, that there are ways that this is appropriate, that there are ways that this is inappropriate, uh, both in the way the communication is happening, but also just the, the tone and, and the language. So there was a great team that came up with the idea that, um, you know, we would uh, read the content and come up with, uh, you know, uh, filters that would say this is inappropriate. Okay, that sounds in principle a good idea until you start yeah. to go down the path and say, well, that's cultural dependent. What about global teams that may be language dependent? And, 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 and you go down the path that you realize that it's incredibly difficult to determine what is appropriate language. I mean, uh, aside from the extremes, obviously. Uh, and and that may not be the first place you want to kind of launch a product. So we ended up saying, this may not be unethical, but it certainly would end up crossing certain lines along the way. Why don't we you know, do other things now? Let the technology mature, let you know the user uh, mature, and then maybe revisit this idea at some other time. So that's an example. It's not a, a, you know, a do or die kind of moment, but it is kind of one where we had a really, you know, there were groups of folks who really wanted to, you know, push this idea because they thought it would make, you know, the, 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 the workplace a better place, you know, but, you know, there were other folks who rightfully pointed out that, you know, what is 
be okay in one culture, may not be okay in another culture. And how do you train on that? And where do you draw the line? And we decided right now we're going to hold off and I'm, I'm, I'm pushing there because we don't want to get ourselves uh, into uh, or our customer into position where uh, this is this tricky uh, territory. And there will be a lot of business leaders listening, both excited by generative AI and also a little bit cautious and worrying about regulation in the future, what happens to their company data, and so many different concerns that maybe it's just holding them back. And I don't want you to share too much here with me today, but I think just to help people listening, are you able to, to share anything around your strategy on how you're utilizing generative AI to create better workplaces and, and how that ultimately aligns with your company's vision and values? Because I think that would be so helpful for a lot of people listening that are still just dipping their toes in the water a little with it. Yeah, so so for, for us, our, our overall vision is we're helping our customers become a great place to work. We're leveraging the proprietary data we've accumulated over de decades to, uh, and our deep understanding of you know some of the metrics that make companies outperform others in their industry. And uh, we need our products to represent that, support that. And, uh, you know, in the last 18 months, you know, one of the, you know, ask that uh, we've made of every product leader in the organization is come back with a plan that says, how is your product helping do that? So if you're the leader of a recruiting product, how are you helping your, our customers become a uh, great places to, place, uh, to work? If you're uh, working on schedule, a frontline worker. How are you making schedule uh, such that it leverages uh, AI to uh, make a greater, a better place to work? So part of the strategy is that is to make sure that every single experiences, every single moment, we think about making our customers, uh, you know, better uh, with data. So we do need to build an enormous amount of proprietary data and have a way to curate that data in a way that, you know, we can augment the work uh, that companies are doing. So that's, you know, at the heart of everything we're doing. The second, uh, and, you know, I'm going to get slightly a bit technical, but not too much. <laughs> you know, the Gen AI uh, is based on, on the uh, large language model, the LLM which is a very powerful thing. It allows you to summarize large amount of data, uh, you know, uh, cluster information, generate more ideas, et cetera. But if you push this think this, this, this technique one extra level, you could have a large action model. And what you're doing there is you're, you're, you're trying to anticipate the need in context of what the users are doing. And that, and that's what we're doing. We're trying to train our platform to know what people want to do and not just give them information, but get them to complete that information. So I'll give you an example. You could say, uh, you know, how much uh, 401k room is available and can you please contribute to the maximum in my next pay cycle? Mm. That getting that done rather than telling you where to find it is different. <laughs> and, and, and that's what we're trying to train so that the experience becomes one of understanding user intent and helping complete the action. All right, now all of a sudden you kind of realize that there's lots of these actions that are ethically very, very, I mean, nobody's gonna be upset if I'm finding a way to help you contribute to your 401k. Uh, and if I make that easy for you, or if you want to, uh, you know, add a dependent, uh, to your dental plan and I make that an easy thing versus like 16 forms and, you know, 17 menus and whatever else you have to do that, that is, that is goodness for all employees. And everybody can rally behind the idea that if I, you know, think about these experiences and I think about the user and I then use technology to augment and give the user a view of where that information or that action is coming, that's helpful. So that's kind of like a big, big theme uh, that we have. The second one is, uh, we call it the three-layered cake. Uh, it's not incredibly uh, sophisticated, but basically it's taking advantage of, there is information today 
that are being used in generative AI that is basically trained on the internet. Basically, whatever information OpenAI and, and Google and, and, and others are able to gather and um, that allows them to, you know, do all the marvelous thing we see, uh, which is, you know, basically predicting how different groups of words should fit together. Uh, it's more than that, but that's a simplistic view. Um, that's great. It has a bunch of issues with data and copyright, and we all saw what the New York Times did and a bunch of other things. But that's that's available today. And that will continue to evolve. It might get regulated, might not get regulated, or in all sorts of different ways. So we don't know. Um, but I think you can augment this very horizontal, universal uh, model with more tailored and specific model, which are more proprietary. So the second layer is UKG specific model that we are training in a specific context for specific set of user and we're training it on data that we own that we have assembled with the permission of the user or the permission of the uh, customer or that you know uh, we've acquired uh, separately and those become proprietary uh, models that you know we can uh, offer our customer um and there you know as long as we're we're, we're being uh careful in the way uh, we we address data residency and 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 a few other things. I think we're less susceptible to you know whatever the uh, some some of the changes that may come uh, from the outside in terms of regulatory changes. Then the third layer is we're making customer specific model. Three layers: the generic one, which is taking advantage of the universe; the second one, which are UKG across customers; and then the third, which is customer specific. And there, what we end up doing is is saying, "Customer, it's your data. You control all the data. You choose how the data is being used. Nobody else will ever see it. And then we're going to make it easy because not everybody can hire you know a hundred data scientists." Uh, we're going to make it easy for you. Uh, a great example, super easy example, is your HR policy manual. That's your. And now we're going to train so that if employees want to ask questions on your HR policy, we can give in context answers to what is doable, not doable, given your HR policy. If we don't have an answer coming out of your HR policy manual, we will default to maybe a more gen, uh, universal model that is trained across multiple uh, customers. Uh, and then we'll tell you, this is not company X uh, HR policy. This is what typically people do, val you know, uh, ve uh, verify with your HR professional. And then the last thing is we can augment that, again, all uh, at the discretion of the configuration of a specific customer. Uh, we can, you know, go and and gather information on the more generic uh, universal model. So you can see that there's these layers of specificity, and all of this is doable today with technology. This is not complicated. So if we uh, go back to your original question, uh, you know, you know, we're, we're we're focused on experiences. We're focused on intent. Uh, we're trying to pick ones that make the most sense uh, from uh, delivering the most value. And then, you know, from a data point of view, we kind of begin to separate the different tiers of data and manage them very carefully. And I think there's a lot of industries, a lot of uh, situation that can adopt similar concepts, not necessarily apply them in a similar way. Uh, but I've kept it generic enough that I think, you know, many of these ideas can be applied. Wow, incredibly cool. And I think we should also give a quick shout out to frontline workers they often get neglected and they actually represent a massive portion of the workforce so uh, with them in mind especially if it's frontline workers listening how are you at UKG leveraging AI to specifically improve their work experience and address some of the challenges that might be unique to their roles yeah no I think you're, you're, to me this is incredibly uh if you if you look uh, and uh, and I've been in Silicon Valley, you know, for, for a good a good portion of my life, and yeah. been hanging around all the the technology disruptor innovators and all that. And and unfortunately, the reality is, you know, a lot of 
really cool stuff gets built for white collars by white collars. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we forget, you know, uh, frontline workers. So, and, and they represent 70% plus of the workforce in industrialized uh, countries. And they, they have different needs. They have different skills. They have different tools. They, some of them can't use their own personal cell phone at work. So they, you do need to think very, very, very differently about the experience, and it's not, it's not the same as uh, you know many uh, of the tools that are tailored for white collars. Now at UKG, we've been very lucky, uh, particularly given our uh, Chronos heritage and workforce management. Uh, it, workforce management is like the clock in, clock out. It is the schedules. And therefore, the, we've been working on, uh, with frontline workers for the past 40 years in manufacturing industry and in the healthcare industry and in the hospitality industry, the retail industry, uh, the restoration industry and, and, the, and uh, the casinos. I mean, the list goes on. So we've learned a lot, learned a lot. And, and what we're trying to do is uh, a few things and again the, it's a moving target there's always more uh that we can do and uh but you know one uh we're we're trying to you know uh augment the historical way of thinking about schedule and shifts which were very much around who's available at what time and who you know uh, hasn't done xyz in the last week and therefore becomes available and how many you know uh stores are you going to open and blah 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 we're, we're turning it around and and making it a bit more dynamic uh we're doing uh you know dynamic shift uh scheduling we're uh helping employees uh you know expose intent so somebody may uh have uh some some desires to be in multiple stores or uh you know may have some life events that are changing so they you know they they, they have a elderly parent that is uh, in need of help and therefore you know offer them some suggestion on how to change their preference and adapt their schedule or in real time uh, you know make it easier for managers to identify people that may be available for uh, you know completing a shift that is not uh uh, available or again uh, suggesting you know these folks work well together <laughs> and you know we we, we, we we achieve more and it's more harmonious when they work together let's kind of encourage uh, these folks to work together so we're, we're building that into uh, you know our, our, our workforce management our scheduler our forecaster uh, to make the experience better so that's one example and there's a lot of that that's already available we're also um you know we're doing a lot of, around collaboration and uh, uh helping employees find information uh if you're new to a specific role uh who are other people that you should uh you know lean on who can mentor who can coach you the creation in real time of employee resource group and facilitate that uh, so those are, you know, other examples around collaboration and communication that we're building into the tool. We're, uh, doing similar things around, uh, career, uh, and skill, uh, building. Uh, we're making it easier for, uh, customers, uh, to identify skills that exist in their uh, existing, uh, employee base. Not, not just LinkedIn, but I remember the frontline workers, don't spend their days filling out their LinkedIn profile. And even that, it's not always um, uh, certified and it's not even, uh, you know, clear that, uh, you know, at what level of uh, competency they have. But if you see somebody operate the same machine three weeks in a row and it's a very specialized machine, we could infer that they have the skill to operate that machine. And use that to inform, you know, opportunities that are made available, for example, or, uh, you know, create uh, some micro learning moments uh, and, and use uh, generative AI to uh, facilitate the content creation for those micro learnings. So there's, there's just an enormous, and again, look at all the examples I gave you. Yeah. It's easy to avoid, you know, being in the, uh, the realm of the Terminator. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
all the jobs are going away or, you know, um, ethically, uh, you know, with moral dilemma. These are all things that you can kind of like say, wow, for the most part, if we kind of don't go off the reservation, we're going to do things that are going to be good for most employees. And, and, and we're trying to build that in the product. Wow. So many cool examples there. And it, with the pace of technological change racing at breakneck, breakneck speed right now, it has become almost impossible to predict the future. But bearing in mind everything we've talked about today and everything that you're seeing with the conversations with your clients, looking forward, how do you envision the integration of AI in workforce management evolving? And and what role will UKG play in, in shaping this future? How do you see all this evolving this year? Yeah, I, listen, I, I think you know, broadly, I'm going to start broad. Um, yeah. I, I think we've had a few shifts in, in the paradigm that have been uh, experienced by employees, right? When we went yeah. and introduced the internet, um, you know, it was a big deal. It was not a big deal. It was a big deal. It, 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 it was a big deal at the end of the day because it, it made a lot of information uh, more transparent and it reduced a lot of friction. That's what the internet did. And it fundamentally changed a lot of industries, a lot of roles. Uh, mobile did the same thing. And, uh, you know, we are, we've been living in a, a browser and app paradigm based on those two discontinuity. I'm going to skip over cloud. Cloud did a bunch of things, but it's more in, in the business model and, and in the back end. I think Gen AI right now is going to create a different paradigm around how uh, employees in the future uh, across workforce management or just HCM more broadly uh, and even the category of HCM is going to change uh, is is going to interface with these applications and this whole idea I'm going to make a very simple example this idea that you open up an app uh, on your browser or on an app and you're going to pull down some menu, try to remember where things are and try to find a way to get that. And then there's going to be a workflow that's going to be triggered. And then there's going to be forms that you're going to fill. Sometimes you print documents, sometimes you upload documents. That whole notion is going to change. It's going to be, you're going to have a conversation uh, and some of it may be written, some of it may be, you know, uh, by voice. <laughs> and you will have your tool of choice be able to identify your intent in context and with personalized understanding of who you are and what you're trying to accomplish and will help facilitate that and give you part of the answer, maybe not the whole answer. So I'll give you a really example that uh, is not uh, too far off. There are some people working on this uh, and it's not even in our industry. Uh, you could say, uh, I would like to go from Miami to uh, London uh, on a vacation with my family. Uh, please find me a modestly priced uh, hotel. Uh, we are three in the family. Uh, we don't feel the need to travel business class. Uh, we're going to be there for three days. Uh, and we'd love to get uh, the recommendation for you know the best shows to go see. Uh, and what are the tickets available? And then it will come back and give you options. It doesn't this end, and then it will say, "Do you want me to book the American Airlines flight?" That da, 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 da. and then please, you know, uh, you know, you've got two children. Are those the ones coming with you? <laughs> and 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 then so that that's kind of like a, an example that everybody can relate to. Think of it in in a, a uh, HCM or workforce. Uh, contacts. I mean, you you could say, um, "I'm sick this week. Uh, please uh, cancel my shifts, uh, and and give me a sense of how it's going to affect my my next paycheck." Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Boom. Here's an answer. And if you move into the more HCM thing, uh, you can say, um, "I'm launching a new project." And I'd love to know who in the company has the following sets of skills uh, that uh, you know are in this time zone, so that I can assemble a SWAT team to go tackle this. Yeah. 
So it's going to be pretty cool. And those are all things, I mean, we're, we're, you know, some of them we're working on, some of them, you know, we've thrown on, on, uh, on the wall, uh, and at some point we may decide to pursue, but that's, that's what's going to happen. So the paradigm is really going to change and it's going to be pretty exciting. Wow, what a what a powerful moment to end our conversation on today. But before I let you go, something I've got to ask because you're right in the heart of this space, and you seem to have a real passion for this uh, topic. And to to be this way, of course, you need to be in a state of continuous learning, and that is a pressure that everybody's feeling around the world at the moment. So, how or where do you self educate, keep up to speed with these trends, and and, and all the, those things that that help you perform better in the workplace? What do yeah. you do? Is there any secrets you can share there? No, and I don't think I've got a, a, a an incredible uh, set of secrets. But I'm I you know I have a passion for learning. I do spend an enormous amount of time uh, in learning. Um, I do block time every week to learn. Absolutely, and it's one of the activities. It's, it's you know on par with going to the gym and spending time with my family um, and. I, I I I enjoy it tremendously. So it's not a core. It's not uh, for career advancement. Uh, I just love to learn, uh, and I will continue to do that all the time. In this case, uh, for AI in particular, I mean there there's there's an enormous uh, amount of literature uh, across blogs and books and podcasts that obviously I I, I keep up with. Um, but beyond that, I think is spending time with people. I really, really, there's a lot of really great folks. I, I did have the benefit of, you know, the Stanford connection and, and the West Coast uh, connection. So I, I do have this this network that I've developed over many, many years that I that I nurture carefully and I, I keep going back to and try to understand where, you know, I mean, some of the stuff coming out of the Stanford AI lab is just mind boggling. And I, I want to, and I spend time with some of the folks there in the labs to see where, where they're going and what they're trying to do and it's it's inspiring and then i try to connect the dots to what we're doing now and then i bring it back into our organization and you know the team knows i'm you know they, they get on sunday night a bunch of uh texts and emails of all the cool stuff i've seen and they know that it's just to stimulate thinking and debate and uh i want everybody to be in that mode of continuously learning growing and 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 trying to you know think through what does it mean for a customer. So it's it's a mindset that's kind of maybe the the most important thing that to take versus the specific podcast or the specific book. Yeah. But uh, beyond that, I think it's a network too. You really do need to invest in in the the, the network, and and you can't keep up. There are too many amazing people out there that know so many things. The best thing you can do is like spend time, extremely focused learning, learning, talking, and asking questions, and being very open-minded. Perfect answer for me. I completely agree with everything you said there. It is about mindset. It is about surrounding yourself with the right the right people, too. And before I let you go, for anyone listening wanting to talk with you, your team, or find out more information about any of the topics that we talked about today, even dive into that survey that we mentioned as well, what's the best starting point for everything? You can always go to ukg.com. There's lots of information on all the products uh, we, we talked about today and, and the survey uh, and all the information. Me personally, I love to hear from folks. So please feel free to you know, reach out uh, on LinkedIn. Um, I'm reasonably active and quite responsive. Uh, and I'm not hard to find. It's exactly as as it is spelled. Um, and um you know, I, I'd love to hear from folks. As I said, I'd love to learn. <laughs> so uh, every one of these uh, outreach for me is an opportunity to uh, learn more. So I'm always excited. Awesome. Well, I'll get those links added to the show notes so people can find you nice and easily. And we talked at the very beginning of the conversation today about employees wanting to embrace, not run from AI, but transparency holds the key there. And we, we've seen some companies cutting corners as they race to adopt AI. And in your report i think it was 56 percent of ex- executives believes it's hey it's better for them to move quickly with ai ai and then address those employee concerns later which just seems insane to me but for me one of the big takeaways i loved hearing how you're maximizing the impact of generative ai but to create better workplaces for employees people managers 
and leaders. And on that note, just thank you for sharing that with me today. Thank you. I appreciate the time. So as we wrap up today's conversation, it's left me pondering, how can businesses navigate the AI landscape ethically while fostering an environment of transparency and trust? They certainly seem to be nailing that over at UKG. And also, how will the implementation of AI shape the future of workforce management, especially the often overlooked frontline workers? Again, something UKG seems to be excelling at at the moment. But I invite you to share your thoughts on today's discussion. Are you seeing AI being embraced in your workshop? How is it impacting your daily professional life? Please join the conversation. Let's continue to demystify the world of technology together so just email me techblogwriter at outlook.com twitter linkedin instagram just at neil c hughes send me a quick message but we're out of time today so thanks for listening as always keep innovating keep teching stay curious and i will be back with you bright and early tomorrow morning Bye.